by then. It's been a long while since we've um, had a little video because we've had the two week Easter holidays. I really hope you did enjoy your Easter and you did get to eat lots of chocolate and spend time with your family at home and rest and play in the gorgeous sunshine that we've had. It's been absolutely beautiful. Um, I thought we'd get back to reading the next part of our book, A Wrinkle in Time. Um, the last chapter we read, we read to the end of chapter three. So we're just about to start chapter four. It's called The Black Thing. Um, and as we know, the last chapter ended um, with us um, getting to know Mrs. Witch, which was the third lady that we had not met yet, one of Charles Wallace's friends. And learn a bit more about her. So let's get our book ready. Let's start with chapter four um, and we'll read a little bit more today. So, The Black Thing. The trees were lashed into a violent frenzy. Meg screamed and clutched at Calvin and Mrs Witch's authoritative voice called out, Quiet, child! Did the shadow fall across the moon or did the moon simply go out, extinguish as abruptly and completely as a candle? There was still the sound of leaves, a terrified, terrifying rushing. All light was gone. Darkness was complete. Suddenly, the wind was gone and all sound. Meg felt that Calvin was being torn from her, and when she reached for him, for her fingers touched nothing. She screamed out, Charles! And whether it was to help him or for him to help her, she did not know. The word was flung back down her throat, and she choked on it. She was completely alone. She had lost the protection of Calvin's hand. Charles was nowhere, either to save or to run to. She was alone in a fragment of nothingness. No light, no sound, no feeling. Where was her body? She tried to move in panic, but there was nothing to move. Just as light and sound had vanished, she was gone too. The corporal Meg simply was not. Then she felt her limbs again. Her legs and arms were tingling faintly, as though they'd been asleep, and she blinked her eyes rapidly, but though she herself was somehow back, Nothing else was. It was not as simple as darkness or absence of light. Darkness has a tangible quality. That means you can almost feel it. It can be moved through and felt. In darkness, you can bark your shins. The world of things still exists around you. She was lost in a horrifying void. It was the same way with silence. There was more than silence. A deaf person could feel vibrations. Here, there was nothing to feel. Suddenly, she was aware of her heart beating rapidly within the cage of her ribs. Had it stopped before? What had made it start again? The tingling in her arms and legs grew stronger and suddenly she felt movement. This movement, she felt, must be the turning of the earth, rotating on its axes, travelling its elliptic course about the sun. And this feeling of moving with the earth was somewhat like the feeling of being in the ocean, out on the ocean and beyond the rising and falling of the breakers, which is like the waves. Lying on the moving water, pulsing gently with the swells and feeling the gentle, inexorable tug of the moon. I'm asleep. I'm dreaming, she thought. I'm having a nightmare. I want to wake up. Let me wake up. Well, Charles Wallace, Wallace's voice said, that was quite a trip. I do think you might have warned us. Light began to pulse and quiver. Meg blinked and shoved shakily at her glasses. And there was Charles Wallace, standing indignantly in front of her, his hands on his hips. Meg, he shouted, Calvin, where are you? She saw Charles and she heard him, but she could not go to him. She could not shove through the strange, trembling light to meet him. I wonder what's happened to them. Calvin's voice came as though it was pushing through a cloud. Well, just give me time, will you? I'm older than you are. Meg gasped. It wasn't that Calvin wasn't there and then he was. It wasn't that part of him came first and the rest of him followed, like a hand and then an arm and an eye and then a nose. It was a sort of shimmering, a looking at Calvin through water, through smoke, through fire. And then there he was, solid and reassuring. Meg, Charles Wallace's voice came. Meg, Calvin, where's Meg? I'm right here, she tried to say, but her voice seemed to be caught at its source. So caught in its throat. Meg, Calvin cried, and he turned around looking about wildly. Mrs Witch, you haven't let Meg behind, have you? Charles Wallace shouted. If you've hurt Meg, any of you, Calvin started. But suddenly Meg felt a violent push and a shattering as though she'd been thrashed from a wall of grass. Oh, there you are, Charles Wallace said and rushed over to her and hugged her. But where am I? Meg asked breathlessly, relieved to hear that her voice was now coming out of her in a more or less normal way. She looked around rather wildly. They were standing in a sunlit field. 
and the air about them is moving with a delicious fragrance that comes only on the rarest of spring days when the sun's touch is gentle and the apple blossoms are just beginning to unfold. She pushed her glasses up her nose to reassure herself that what she was seeing was real. They'd never, um, they'd left the silver of glint of a biting autumn evening and now round them was golden with light. The grass in the field were a tender new green and scattered about were tiny multicoloured flowers. Meg slowly turned to face a mountain reaching so high into the sky that its peak was lost in a crown of puffy white clouds. I like the idea of, of the clouds being like a crown on top of the mountain. From the trees at the base of the mountain came a sudden singing of birds. There was an air of such ineffable peace and joy all around her that her heart's wild thumping slowed. When shall we meet again? In thunder, lightning or in rain? came Mrs. Hu's voice. Suddenly, the three of them were there, Mrs. Watson with her pink stole askew, Mrs. Hu with her spectacles gleaming, and Mrs. Witch still little more than a shimmer. Delicate, multicoloured butterflies were fluttering about them, as though in greeting. Mrs. Watson and Mrs. Hu began to giggle, and they giggled until it seemed that whatever their private joke was, they would fall down with a wild fun of it. The shimmer seemed to be laughing too. It became vaguely darker and more solid, and then there appeared a figure in a black robe and a black peaked hat Beady eyes, a beak nose, long grey hair, one bony claw, clutched a broomstick. Well, just to keep you girls happy, the strange voice said, and Mrs Watson and Mrs Who fell into each other's arms in gales of laughter. If you ladies have had your fun, I think you should tell Calvin and Meg a little more about all this, Charles Wallace said coldly. You scared Meg half out of her wits whisking her off this way without any warning. Fixerint amini rero a peculu loquentus. Mrs. Hu intoned. Horace, to action little, less to words inclined. Mrs. Hu, I wish you'd stop quoting, Charles Wallace said, very annoyed. Mrs. Watson adjusted her stole. A stole is like something you would wear around your neck. She not know this. But she finds it so difficult to verbalise, Charles dear. It helps her if she can quote instead of working out words of her own. And we mustn't lose our senses of humour, Mrs. Witch said. The only way to cope with something deadly serious is to try to treat it a little lightly. Well that's going to be hard for Meg, Mrs Watson said. It's going to be hard for her to realise that we are serious. What about me, Calvin asked. Well the life of your father isn't at stake, Mrs Watson told him. Well, what about Charles Wallace then? Mrs Watson's unoiled door hinge voice was warm with affection and pride. Charles Wallace knows. Charles Wallace knows that it's far more than just the life of his father. Charles Wallace knows what's at stake. But remember, Mrs. Who said, and now she's saying something in another language that is actually words, it's just symbols, so I can't read that, I'm afraid. But basically it means, nothing is hopeless, we must hope for everything. Where are we now and how did we get here? Calvin asked. Uriel, the third planet of the star Malik in a spiral nebula, Messier 101. This I'm supposed to believe, Calvin asked indignantly. As you like, Mrs. Witch said coldly. For some reason, Meg felt that Mrs. Witch, despite her looks in it for real broomstick, was someone in whom one could put complete trust. It doesn't seem any more peculiar than anything else that's happened. Well, then someone just tell me how we got here. Calvin's voice was still angry and his freckles seemed to stand out on his face. Even travelling at the speed of light, it would take us years and years to get here. Oh, we don't travel at speed of anything, Mrs. Watson explained earnestly. We tessa, or you might say, we wrinkle. Clear as mud, Calvin said. Tessa, Meg thought. Could that have anything to do with Mother's tesseract? She was about to ask when Mrs. Witch started to speak and one did not interrupt when Mrs. Witch was speaking. Mrs. Watson is young and naive. She keeps thinking she can explain things in words, Mrs. Who said. Um, que plus sa, que plus suta. French, you know. The more a man knows, the less he talks. But she has to use words for Meg and Calvin, Charles reminded Mrs. Who. If who you brought them along, they have a right to know what's going on. Meg went up to Mrs. Witch. In the intensity of her question, she'd forgotten all about the Tesseract. Is my father here? Mrs. Witch shook her head. Not here, Meg. Let Mrs. Watts explain. She's young and the language of words is easier for her than it is for Mrs. Who and me. We stopped here, Mrs. Watts explained, more or less to catch our breaths and to give you a chance to know what you're up against. 
But what about Father Megas? Is he all right? For the moment, love, yes. He's one of the reasons we're here. But you see, he's only one. Well, where is he, please? Take me to him. We can't. Not yet, Charles said. You have to be patient, Meg. But I'm not patient, Meg cried passionately. I've never been patient. Mrs. Hugh's glasses shone at her gently. If you want to help your father, then you must learn patience. Vitum impendia vero. To stake one's life for the truth. This is what we must do. This is what your father is doing, Mrs. Watson nodded. Her voice, like Mrs. Hughes, very serious, very solemn. Then she smiled, her radiant smile. Now, why don't you three children wander around and Charles can explain things a little? You're perfectly safe in your That's why we stopped here to rest. But aren't you coming with us? Meg asked fearfully. There was silence for a moment. And then Mrs. Witch raised her authoritative hand. Show them, she said to Mrs. Watson. And at something in her voice, Meg felt prickles of apprehension. Now, Mrs. Watson asked, her creaky voice rising to a squeak. Whatever it was Mrs. Witch wanted them to see, it was something that made Mrs. Watts uncomfortable too. Now, Mrs. Witch said, they may as well know. Should, should I change? Mrs. Watts asked. Better. Well, I hope it won't upset the children too much, Mrs. Watts murmured, as though to herself. Should I change too, Mrs. Hugh asked. Oh, but I've had fun in these clothes. But I have to admit, Mrs. Watson is the best at it. Der's Wick adopted den Meister, German. The work proves the craftsman. Shall I transform now too? Mrs. Witch shook her head. No, not yet. Not here. You may wait. Now, don't be frightened, loves, Mrs. Watson said. Her plump little body began to shimmer, to quiver, to shift. The wild colours of her clothes became muted, which means they became um, dark and not so colourful. Whitened. The pudding bag shape stretched lengthways, lengthened, merged, and then suddenly before the children was a creature more beautiful than any Meg had ever imagined, and the beauty lay in far more than the outward description. Outwardly, Mrs. Watsit was surely no longer a Mrs. Watsit. She was a marble white body with powerful flanks, like legs. Uh, something like a horse, but at the same time completely unlike a horse. Far from the magnificent model black sprang a noble formed torso, arms and a head resembling a man's, but a man with a perf uh, perfection of dignity and virtue, an exaltation of joy such as Meg had never seen. No, she thought, it's not like a Greek centaur, not in the least. From the shoulder slowly a pair of wings unfolded, wings made of rainbows, of light upon water, of poetry. Calvin fell to his knees. No, this is what it said. Though her voice was not Mrs. Watts's voice, not to me, Calvin, never to me. Stand up. Carry them, Mrs. Witch commanded. With a gesture both delicate and strong, Mrs. Watts knelt in front of the children, stretched her wings wide, holding them steady but quivering. On to my back now, the new voice said. All right, we're going to leave it there about halfway through that chapter and we'll find out a little bit more um, about our three characters later on and why they've stopped in Uriel, and what it is it they're planning to do, as well as saves Meg's father. And if this is what um, Mrs. What's It looks like now as a, as a horse, then we will wait and see what all the other um, characters look like as well. So thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you check the website for the work for this week and the weekly challenge. Please send us more photos of what you've been getting up to and photos of your work. It's really lovely to see. And I'll update you soon with a new video, okay? Bye-bye, year five!